As the global leader in choline, Balchem has spent more than 50 years perfecting the art and science of choline chloride production. The new Puricol line delivers the highest standards of quality, produced in state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities, and backed by the strictest process controls for a level of purity, safety, and consistency you can't find anywhere else. Turn to Puricol choline chloride from Balchem for an unmatched level of quality you can trust. Visit balchemanh.com to learn more. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. In this webinar, we will dive into the role fiber can play in monogastric nutrition. Dr. Xavier Russo from AB Vista is here to walk us through some of the new research and protocols for extracting the value within fiber for improving profitability. But before we get started, let's go through a few housekeeping items to be sure today's session runs smoothly. On the screen, you should see the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this uh, on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using the computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having any audio issues, please reach out via the questions box and we can give you more specific instructions on how to troubleshoot the problems. You can submit questions to Dr. Russo by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. If we don't have time to answer your specific question today, we'll work with Dr. Russo to get them answered. In the handouts tab, you can access a copy of today's slide deck and a participation certificate to claim your ARPAS EU credits. Within 48 hours of today's webinar, we will upload a recording of the session at balchemanh.com slash real science. I would now like to introduce Dr. Xavier Russo. Dr. Russo is Global Technical Support Manager at AB Vista based in France. She joined the company eight years ago after completing her PhD work on mineral optimization in poultry and swine with the National Institute of Agri uh, Agronomic Research in France better known as INRA, and Agriculture Canada. During this time, she acquired extensive knowledge on the interactions between calcium, phosphorus, and animal physiology. Her latest area of, of interest is the dietary fiber fraction and how to better characterize it. She is in, uh, investigating different strategies to optimize fiber use for monogastric diets. Xavier, you should now have control of the screen. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for your very kind introduction. And just before I start, can you please confirm that you can all see my screen in the, the full, uh, full, full screen? Yes, it looks fine. Thank okay. you. Perfect. So thank you, Scott. And thank you for the Balcam uh, team to organize this uh, lecture series that I found very interesting. And thank you all of you in front of your screen to, to listening to me uh, today. I hope you will, you will find it useful. So um, I was asked today to look and explore uh, the use of enzymes and fiber with a focus on gut health. So um, my presentation today will be divided in three uh, parts. So the first will be a kind of introduction looking at gut and health. Then uh, we will explore in the second part how enzymes can help and what would be the the strategy on um, the how to use enzymes beyond the nutritional matrix value as we used to, to use. And last, so in the last part, I will explore the fiber um, because there is a lot of new data and research uh, in this area and going through how, what is it fiber, where we are and how we can uh, optimize their inclusion with uh, today uh, the focus on the, the good gut health. So let's um, start and um, we've got an F. Uh, so from what I read, from what I heard, and we can define a gut health as a gut free of illness with high ability to counteract any enteric challenge. So as you can see, I'm not speaking only on the free of illness, but also about the capacity of the animals to be able, in any case, to cope with any enteric challenge. So basically, 
from the nutrition point of view, what we can do, and to be honest, everything that will allow effective nutrient digestion, absorption, and fermentation will play a role in this gut health. In two different pillars, uh, in acting on the gut integrity through the absorption, but also limiting the entry of the, the pathogen and answering the homeostatic balance, but not only the gut integrity, so we just not need to, to consider the gut as a tube, but also is involved in a lot of function and metabolic pathways. So we need to consider the gut functionality, like the effect and the link with the immune system and the inflammatory response, for example. So where we can play a role with enzymes and fiber is first, ensure effective digestion and absorption. Second, having an optimal and balanced uh, microbiome uh, to limit the pathogen uh, growth, but also uh, boost the beneficial fermentation. And also we can help uh, to ensure a good immune status innate and acquired and reduce the inflammatory response when we need to. So let's go back to the gut. So here uh, you can see the, the gut. It's not a poultry or swine, but that's, that's a gut just for to illustrate the, the presentation. And follow in, in the gut, we will find different um, situation where we have a different kind of oxygen concentration, different pH and different temperature. And that is going to lead to different uh, kinds of process. So in the upper part of the gut, so here in the gastric um, area, we will find very low pH or very acidic uh, content and very low microbe load. So that's where you have the solubilization of the nutrients and where uh, we have the first step of the digestion. Then going down, moving down to the gastrointestinal tract, we have some absorption. So depending on the nutrients, we will have absorption at different uh, sites, but mainly in, in the duodenum. And then more we are moving down, the pH is increasing, close to neutral in the end part of the gut, and where we are going to find a lot of microbe and specifically very low oxygen concentration. So it's where we have the anaerobic uh, fermentation. So we have to consider thinking about gut health, this three step of the digestion process and where we can play a role with the fiber and enzyme. Fiber and enzymes will play a role in the digestion process. So fiber with the insoluble and soluble part. Insoluble will play mainly a role in the gastrointestinal tract development and the soluble will uh, deal with viscosity, for example, and the enzymes will basically uh, increase the, the digestion of different kinds of substrate. So that's for the upper part of the gut. But what we need to also consider is fiber because it's clearly what is going uh, down to the gut because it's, it's, it's not really digestible. So it's finally what we are going to find in the end part of the gut and what is going to be available for the fermentation. And this can also play a role in gut health. So in a gut health um, perspective, we need to consider the non-digestible that is going to be excreted directly, but also the digestible because it's going to be absorbed and available in, in the metabolic part. But, and, and specifically, we have also to consider the non-digestible that is going to be fermentable that we, so far, we underestimate, especially in, in, in monogastrics. So let's start now with the first uh, enzyme, uh, that is the phytase. Um, why to start with phytase? It's because it's the, I think, the mostly uh, used uh, enzymes that is going to be present in all the monogastric uh, feed. And we often look at phytase because of the nutritional matrix value in terms of calcium, phosphorus, energy, protein, and amino acids. But today I will really focus on what we can expect from a phytase application in terms of gut health. So go back to some basics uh, regarding phytase. Is the, the substrate of the phytase is the phytate, okay? 
and more than being a phosphorus storage, phytate molecules have a lot of negative effects in terms of the digestion process. So I just took um, two examples, uh, but there is many more examples uh, to show the negative effect of phytate on the digestibility. So the first one in this graph is the negative effect of phytate. So here you have the concentration of phytate and the effect of the solubility of the protein. And you can see that when you increase the phytate, you uh, decrease the solubility of the protein. And that's here in this range. It's what we can find uh, usually in the broiler diet, for example, in terms of phytate. So it, in fact, there is a clear uh, negative effect of phytate because it, it has a, um, a high binding effect of the nutrients, so it can be protein, but uh, you know also it's also calcium, can be zinc, magnesium, uh, copper, iron. So it has this very high affinity for different kinds of, of nutrients that decrease their availability. But also not only the, the, the this binding capacity, but it also reduces the activity of uh, endogenous um, enzymes that are involved in the digestion process. So I took this example of the amylase activity. So here you have the amylase activity for a low phytate or normal phytate diet, so 0.22% or a high phytate diet, 0.44% without or with some phytase. And if we focus on the zero, so without, consider, without considering the phytase, you can see that increasing the phytate in the diet will decrease the amylase activity. And you can see that even at the low phytate uh, concentration, you have some gap uh, to, to reach or some space to, to improve uh, in terms of the amylase activity. So it's in one way, binding the nutrients, limiting their digestibility and availability for absorption, but also reducing the efficacy of the digestion process. So if we look back to this um, figure um, representing the, the pH and the different uh, part of, of the gut, what phytate is doing is to create some um, big undigestible uh, pool and because there is this big undigestible pool, the, the animals will react in producing more uh, pepsinogen, but also chlorhydric acid. So you have an acidification of the, of the gastric area to help and trying to digest this undigestible fraction. So because you have this acidification and because the animals are very clever and they want to protect the gastric uh, cell wall, so the stomach or the, the gizzard uh, cell wall, they will also produce some mucin. So mucin is it's amino acids to protect the, the, the gastric area, but also some bicarbonate to buffer uh, the, 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 the gastric area. And all of this is endogenous uh, losses. So this is the first negative impact of phytate, but also what we want to avoid is to have this uh, protein not digested, sorry, now we go back. Yeah. So we, what we don't want as well is to have this protein, for example, not digested and not absorbed because they are going to go down till the, the cica or the colon and will be involved in the fermentation process, increase the pH. So increase the pH means that you have more facility for the pathogen to establish but also the protein that will be fermented in the gut is um, is, is producing uh, toxic uh, substances. So it's, it's really not something we want to, to see. So considering phytase and gut health, what we need to do is to think phytase beyond the matrix value, so mineral or amino acids. And what we want to do to, in using phytase for gut health is to destroy and to break down as maximum as we can the phytate or IP6, but not only. It's also the IP5, the IP4, the IP3, and the IP2, because all of them will have this binding capacity. And so that's one part of the, 
of the, the effect of phytase and using idols of phytase, it's really to have a goal in destroying all of these uh, phytate esters, but also release key nutrients, as I just showed you, and producing the inositol. Inositol is the, is the last ring of the, the phytate, and we know that it is involved in many metabolic pathways that are responsible for the performance increase, for example, we, we see when we use superdosing concepts, but also is linked uh, very closely with the activity of the alkaline phosphatase. So I will show you why it's important to reach uh, this inositol production in hydrolyzing a maximum of uh, phosphate esters. So the first um, is releasing Q nutrients. So I will go to through three uh, example, and the first one is the zinc in in the in, in swine. Um, and in fact, just I'm moving. Okay. So here you have a graph uh, looking at the effect of zinc. We know that zinc is used to reduce the the diarrhea problem in in piglets, but is also known to have a very good effect on, on performance. And that's also a nutrient we would need to think a bit more because it is bound in some countries and we would need to reduce the, the amount of zinc because of the environmental concern. So that's something very important to consider. So if we look at the effect of zinc here on the, on the serum, you can see that increasing, you increase the zinc uh, serum, okay? And that's something you can achieve with high dose of phytase. So it, it, it was used to 2,500 FTU per kilo of phytase. And you can see that this high dose of phytase allowed to reach the same level of zinc in the serum. And how it this translate uh, practically, I would say. So here you have the fecal score for piglets from zero to 10 day post winning. And you have the effect of um, incremental dose of zinc in PPM here, without, in orange, uh, any phytase or with a high dose of phytase in, in the blue line. And you can see that um, in all the cases, you have a decrease of the fecal score when you use the high dose of phytase. And in average, we observe the 6% six, six decrease of the winning diarrhea in using this uh, very high dose of phytase. So that's for zinc. Here's some data for copper because phytate can also bind the copper. So some data in poultry here. So that's the results of a meta-analysis performed in, in, in broilers on copper digestibility, where they look at the copper digestibility in the y-axis here, uh, depending of the phytate dose on the x-axis. And that's clearly in chickens, when you increase the dose of phytate, so hydrolyze the phytate, you will increase the copper uh, digestibility. This work was done with all generation of phytate, so you can imagine how we can perform with the new generation of phytase. So that's in poultry, but look in swine, where there is a clear, um, demand to, to decrease the, the copper. Um, we look at the uh, how using a phytase can help in reducing the copper, but in keeping and maintaining the, the good effect of copper on the on the gut health and the performance. So on in blue here in the blue bars you have the effect of copper on the average daily gain. So here from zero to 250 ppm, you can see the, the nice increase of the, of the performance without any phytase. And here is the response with a 2000 of phytase. And finally, what this tells us is that with using, in using, sorry, idols of phytase, you can even decrease the, the copper from 250 to 62.5 without uh, impairing the performance and keeping the, the, the beneficial effect of the copper inclusion. So for zinc for copper, but we also have some data in with the iron that is also important. So here I just present you um, a trial where we look at the incorporation of 150 ppm of organic iron. And we look in terms of performance and score score. And you can see that there is no significant effect of adding uh, iron in this case, um, regardless the, the performance or the score score. 
but that's without the superdosing of phytase. But when you do the same, but with the high dose of phytase, there is a clear effect. So on on the performance, but also a, a nice trend to decrease the score score. So the iron supplementation improves the performance and reduces the score, but when uh, and more efficiently when you use idols of five days. So that was the first part, really zinc nutrients like the zinc, iron, copper, that uh, we know have an effect uh, to control uh, the, the gut health. And the second um, effect is the hydrolysis of the IP6. Phytic acid IP6 uh, is represented here. So you have an inositol ring with 6 phosphate. And what the phytase is doing is to remove one phosphate, up one phosphate, and create an IP5. Then you remove again another phosphate and you create an IP4. And again, again, till the IP3, IP2, till the IP1. And IP1 will be hydrolyzed by the alkaline phosphatase to produce inositol. Exogenous enzymes are not going to produce inositol, but what the phytase is doing is really to facilitate the activity of alkaline phosphatase to produce inositol in breaking down IP6, IP5, IP4, IP3, and IP2 to produce the IP1. So depending on the product, the dose you are using, you are going to stop at different steps. So here is the matrix of phosphorus when you are releasing the, the, the phosphate, but I'm not going to speak about that today. So why inositol is important? Because inositol is going to be involved in many other uh, pathways when it's going to be absorbed by the, by the intestine. So here you have the inositol, so mu inositol, that is going to be absorbed in the intestine through a, a co-transporter that is the SMIT2. Uh, and then it is going to join the, the plasma. You have some uh, de novo uh, biosynthesis, but also some reabsorption from the, the, the kidney. And then it is going to be um, shared or spread in different kinds of organs, brain, a kidney, and different tissues and, and cells. As the, I, so it's going to be rephosphilated in IP5, in the erythrocytes, so responsible for the blood oxygenation. It's going also to play a role as a second messenger, for example, but also be a constituent of the membrane uh, phospholipids and many others that I'm not going to uh, go to in details uh, today. So what we have seen with uh, phytase um, what we, we have we looked at is the expression of the, the gene coding for the different transporter uh, following different dose of five days application. So you can see 0, 500, 1500, and 4500. And at the high dose of five days, you can see there is a, a nice increase of the, the, the expression of the gene coding for this uh, transporter and mainly the SMIT2. And if you if you remind, this MIT2 is the co-transporter in the intestine. So it, it means that you facilitate the absorption of the inositol, but it also may indicate that you have a greater phytate breakdown in using this uh, very high dose of phytase. So what could be the practical application, I would say, why I'm, I'm speaking about this uh, when thinking on gut health? You know that um, at winning, that's um, um, a big stress uh, for the piglets. And when they are in a stress uh, condition, you have uh, the gut that is uh, um, uh, disbalanced and, and very weak. And you can see an increase of the Escherichia coli population. And this Escherichia coli population drive to the increase of the LPS antigenicity that are responsible for the anti-inflammatory response that led to the diarrhea we often observed. That is a real problem in, in piglets. So what we also know is that the LPS antigenicity is regulated by the alkaline phosphatase. 
that means that when you have a high activity of the alkaline uh, alkaline phosphatase, you decrease the antigenicity of the LPS, and so on, you have a low inflammatory response and less diarrhea. So going more in deep in the cascade of reaction, what uh, is going to influence the alkaline phosphatase activity? Zinc. Zinc is one of the activators of the alkaline phosphatase. So finally, when we use the zinc oxide to reduce the diarrhea, May, it, it, it is probably because this cascade of reaction activating the alkaline phosphatase, reducing the antigenicity of the LPS, and so on, reducing the diarrhea. So how we can play with the zinc? Phytase. Very high dose of phytase, I show you, will help to release more zinc or to increase the availability of zinc to stimulate the alkaline phosphatase. And it's why we also see uh, less diarrhea when using high dose of phytase. So how it works? Here you have um, a figure showing you the LPS, so this one. So you have the LPS molecule with the antigen, the core, and here you have two uh, phosphorus. And what the alkaline phosphatase is doing is to take out one of these phosphorus that make the LPS not able to be recognized by the binding protein that lead to the inflammation. So when you increase the alkaline phosphatase, you increase finally, or you decrease the capacity of the LPS to be recognized and you lower the inflammation process. And it seems that phytase can be also able to take out this uh, phosphorus, reducing the inflammation, this, the, the inflammation response. So what does it mean in, for the intestine? And when you have a high activity of the alkaline phosphatase, you guarantee a good barrier integrity. And having a good barrier integrity makes you able to have a good absorption of the nutrients through, through the cells. And also the alkaline phosphatase will increase the common soul bacterial growth to control any intestinal disorder, so guaranteeing a good homeostasis, detoxifying the LPS to prevent the inflammation. So that's what we need to reach to guarantee a good gut health. When it's not happening, when you have a decrease of the alkaline phosphatase activity, you lose this prior integrity. That makes the nutrients less absorbed, but also you lose the homeostasis and that can lead to sepsis and the pathogen entry. So you really need to boost this alkaline phosphatase activity. So from what you, we can find in the literature here is the, the effect of the, of the alkaline uh, phosphatase when you are in presence of the Eche Chacolé. So here it's, it's a work in mice looking at the injection of Escheri Chacoli, so a lethal injection of Escheri Chacoli on the survivability of the, of the mice. And you can see in the, in the, in the black square here, the, the survivability of the, of the mice when they received the injection of the lethal E. coli. You can see that they, they didn't survive uh, a lot because four of the five mice, mice uh, died uh, within the first 24 uh, hours. But when you look at this um, um, white uh, square, where the mice received uh, the Escheri Chacoli, so the same dose of lethal injection of Escheri Chacoli, but mixed with some intestinal alkaline phosphatase, you can see that you have a pretty much better effect on the survivability of the, of the mice. And that means that the alkaline phosphatase is really helping in reducing the inflammatory response and keeping them alive. If we look at the alkaline phosphatase in piglets, uh, in fact, it is reduced when uh, at winning, so because of the stress. Here it's a, a paper published in 2010 looking at the activity of the alkaline uh, phosphatase in the duodenum and the jejunum, so proximum, uh, proximal and distal uh, jejunum, in suckling pigs here in the dark blue, or in wind pigs at 10 days. And you can see that uh, the, regardless the, the section of the intestine, you have a reduction at winning 
uh, of the alkaline uh, phosphatase activity. And in, in poultry now, and it's again, this is the activity of the alkaline uh, phosphatase depending of the magnesium here in, in color, but also depending of the zinc. And you can see that in increasing the zinc and uh, the, mag the magnesium have an effect and improved or increased the activity of the alkaline phosphatase. So where we are in the, in the gut of a, of, of a poultry, magnesium is around 0.6 millimole. So more close to the orange bar. And in terms of zinc, we are more in between these two. So you can see that there is a lot of space for us to improve and to, and to increase the activity of the alkaline phosphatase in improving the zinc and magnesium uh, availability. And we know uh, that phytate is going to have an effect of the alkaline phosphatase, and it's probably because it is linked to the zinc and the magnesium. Because as you can see on this study, you have the alkaline phosphatase activity in the control here, and here with the high level of phytate. And when you, inc you decrease the phytate here, you uh, counteract this effect until to get the the high level of the alkaline phosphatase. And in, in the gut, we are, in terms of the phytic acid concentration, we are more in this range. So you can see again, there is some space to, to improve. So to conclude on phytase application in for gut health um, perspective, um, in fact, the first is uh, using uh, phytase to increase the digestibility of, of the protein and to lowering the to lower the, the putrefaction effect in the gut, so lowering the protein fermentation in the iron gut. So there is some more enzymes that are working on the digestibility of protein, like the, the protease. So I just took uh, this example here, looking at the effect uh, of the protease. But that's also interesting because here you have the control digestibility. Uh, here is the change in digestibility with using a protease. And clearly, if you have a, already had very high digestibility, so let's say 70% with your phytase, what you can expect with your protease is between 0 and 10% uh, more improvement. But at least all enzymes um, working and helping in the digestibility of protein uh, will have a beneficial effect in terms of gut health. Second point is that, in fact, the idols of phytase will release key nutrients, so zinc, copper, iron, that have beneficial effect on, on gut health, but not only in terms of the availability, but also in terms of the cascade of reaction. As I show you, the alkaline phosphatase will depend of the, the activity will depend of the zinc, for example. And so we need to, to release uh, this zinc to reduce the enteric uh, inflammation and can be a very good um, uh, strategy to use in, in, in winning phase to reduce the diarrhea. Uh, but also we would need to look at the high level of phytase and the, the production of uh, inos, high production of inositol uh, with the antioxidant effect, but also as I show you the role of inositol in the in the formation of the erythrocyte that can help in the blood oxygenation that are two main um, hypotheses uh, responsible uh, for the woody breast. So in using this type of strategy, we already show with the high dose of phytase, we can reduce the, the incidence of the, the very high score of the, of the woody breast. So that's for phytase. The other a category of enzymes I would like to go through is the NSP uh, enzyme. That's again, another one uh, commonly used in monogastric feed. So what are the mode of action of NSP enzymes? So first, it's opening the cell wall, and mainly from the insoluble uh, fiber. But this hypothesis is really questioned and to, because we are not sure it's really the, the main mechanism responsible for all the benefits we can see with the use of NSP enzymes. The second is the reduction of the intestinal viscosity. So that is more related to the soluble fiber and more for um, high viscous diet like the wheat and barley-based diet. 
And the third point is the production of oligosaccharides that have prebiotic effect. So I'm going to focus on this point uh, today because we are more uh, interesting to look at the gut health effect. So what this, uh, the NSPAs uh, are doing, they are look hydrolyzes the non-star polysaccharides. What is the main non-star polysaccharides? Is the arabinoxylin. Arabinoxylin is more than 50%, depending on the raw materials. Um, it's the main representant of the NSP before the cellulose and, and the, the, the beta-glucanes. So I'm going to look at the effect of xylenase. So first, what, what is it? That's the, my arabinoxylin, so that's my substrate for the, for, for the xylenase. And that's a, a big chain of xylose with some arabinose that are branched. And these xylose are linked by, by beta-1,4 lesion. And it's where the, the xylenase is going to hydrolyze. And the results of this hydrolysis is the production of arabino xylo oligosaccharide. So you get this long chain in, in small uh, fragments that we call axos. So depending of the, the enzymes, depending of the, the different activity of the NSP enzymes, you may have a different concentration of, of axos produced, but also different profile of the axos produced. So here, just an example, uh, comparing three different uh, products. So you have a pure xylenase here, a multi-enzyme product, and another pure xylenase here. So you can see that the, the profile, the concentration first is different, but uh, more importantly, the, the profile of the different axos produced is different, with this one producing more X3 and X2 to X4, this one producing more in proportion X3 and X2, but relatively more arabinose. So you can see that you have, depending on the product you are using, you are going to produce different kind of uh, arabinoxylo oligosaccharides. And that's very important, but because, you know, I, I told you in the introduction that um, it's not digestible, fiber is not digestible. So this axos is going to move through the gastrointestinal tract and arriving in, in, the, in the end part of the gut, where you we are going to have fermentation. And the fermentation will be different depending on the substrate you are giving to the microbiome. So I will show you some example in terms of what is going uh, to be the results of the fermentation uh, with, the, with using a, a pure uh, xylenase. So at 21 days, you have the concentration of the different acids, so short chain fatty acids uh, produced in the Sika. At 21 days, you can see that uh, comparing to the control in the dark blue, when you have a feed supplemented with a xylenase, you will increase uh, the fermentation and mainly to the production of butyrate here. That is even more true at 41 days because in between you have some time for the microbiome to be well established and able to cope with this axos and ferment this axos to produce more uh, butyrate that we know have beneficial effect on the gut integrity. So it's not only the production of short chain fatty acid because what we also see is the increase of the xylenase activity in the Sika. So here you have the Giza, the ileum, and the Sika. And we look at the xylenase activity when birds were fed a control or were fed with a, 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 a diet supplemented with a xylenase. And clearly, when they were supplemented with the xylenase, you have uh, in this difference uh, more xylenase activity. That means that the, the microbiome even produce their own xylenase activity to help to degrade the fiber and produce this um, the fermentation and products. So depending of the axos, so this kind of fiber arriving in the Sika, you will uh, be you you will have different cascade of reaction uh, in place. So depending of this, you have the monosaccharides, you have different microbiome in place that will then produce more lactate or more succinate or more propionate or more butyrate. So you need to be careful of what is arriving in the hind gut and control the substrate to be sure you are going to produce the right one or the, the one you want. 
and practically what what's this what's the effect so here an example in swine where you have uh, different uh, trials run in 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 pigs so in growing finishing pigs and we look at the livability when they receive the control or feed supplemented with oxyrenase and you can see that in all the case you have an improvement of the livability more or less depending of the of the trials but in average we have 2.6 percent improvement of the livability when uh, pigs were fed uh, oxyrenase and it's probably because of the um, effect of cyanase in producing right uh, axos that is fermented by the microbes and increase the, the volatile fatty acids uh, production like the like the butyrate for example and we know this is representing energy for the enterocytes that translates in better livability in swine so my last part will now be on fiber so looking at fiber and gut health in monogastric we have um, um, recently uh, more and more data uh, and research uh, in this area so what wh where we are in terms of fiber in, in monogastrics and we in the past and even even now we are using crude fiber in in poultry to characterize the fiber fraction in the in the feed in the diet but you can see that if you look at the total dietary fiber crude fiber is really representing a, a small portion so it's not really representative of fiber and in in swine more looking at the ndf and adf that is a step uh, further i would say but uh, it's 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 yet not the, the, the best criteria to, to look at because it's mainly the insoluble compounds. So compounds, so it's not only insoluble fiber, but also all the insoluble fraction that will arrive. So that's really not the best to characterize the fiber fraction. So where we are now, it's to look at the non-stark polysaccharides that are the cellulose, the hemicellulose and, and the pectin, and looking at the this NSP, plus lignin represent the total dietary fiber. What is interesting and why moving to this is that fiber is, is, is not something we are looking more and more uh, because it can be uh, considered as an alternative to replace or to at least to improve the gut health in a context where we are going to reduce or replace the, the antibiotic, for example. But also in some cases, we have some uh, local ingredients or availability of ingredients that have a different kind of fiber profile and we need to deal with it. So uh, it's really important to have a better characterization of, of this fiber fraction and, and also how we can extract the value of this uh, fraction. So. Where we are now, it's to, to move from the crude fiber and the NDF step by step to the total dietary fiber, that is the NSP plus lignin, as what we have done in the past, moving from the crude protein to the individual amino acids to get more insights and more accurate uh, value uh, of this uh, protein. So, in fact, when you look at the NSP, we are now able to look at the soluble and the insoluble fraction. That is already a very good start. But also, we are able to look at the individual components of this NSP that will, be, that will have different effect in terms of microbiome fermentation, for, for example. So, in terms of fiber in monogastric, we are clearly moving uh, towards a better characterization of the functionality of fiber. So not only the concentration, but also uh, what's the meaning uh, practically for us in, in, the, in the monogastric nutrition, looking at the solubility and the fermentability. So first, some, some words regarding the insoluble part of this uh, NSP. So I took this example, the recent example, where the, the authors look at the interaction uh, between the insoluble fiber uh, inclusion here and the, the use of phytase on the relative proventicarist and gizzard weight. So, and as you can see, uh, doesn't matter if you are uh, without or with phytase, but when you increase the insoluble concentration of insoluble fiber, you have an increase of the relative 
proven to curious kids that weight. So you improve the gastrointestinal tract uh, development. And it's even more true when you have phytase in there. So and there are a lot of literature available um, showing uh, insoluble fiber effect on the gizzard development, the gut function, uh, resulting, resulting in beneficial effects in terms of digestibility, intestinal integrity, gut health, but also welfare. Uh, I'm thinking on laying hands, for example. And in swine, um, some, some data show that the low amounts of insoluble NSP can prevent um, for a prolonged uh, digestive retention in the in, in the stomach and in the in the intestine, uh, that reduce the risk of the bacterial uh, overgrowth, uh, especially in the small intestine where we we don't want this growth, but also increasing the feed intake, uh, for example. So there is some application in using insoluble fibers. So that's not always bad, but it needs to be well controlled. So moving to the um, fiber, because I. I cannot speak on fiber without uh, speaking about uh, on microbiome because they are clearly linked together because fiber is the substrate uh, for the microbiome. As you can see on this graph, you have the feed composition here. So you have the total dietary fiber around 15%, let's say. And finally, because it's very low digestible, it, it's going to represent uh, the, the substrate, the main substrate uh, for, for the bacteria in the gut, because here it's the composition of the digester in the ileum. So clearly that's the substrate uh, for the bacteria to, to ferment. So what we want to, what, what should be our goal uh, in terms of fiber and microbiome? We need to have a balance. So we need to reduce this protein fermentation because as I told you, uh, it leads to toxic effect and higher pH in, in the iron gut. But what we need is to have a proper balance and have more carbohydrate fermentation than protein uh, fermentation. And you also need to control this carbohydrate that is going to be fermented because depending on them, you are going to have different kinds of acid production, so lactate, acetate, butyrate, propionate, for example. But all carbohydrate fermentation will lead to a lower pH that will help to decrease the establishment of uh, pathogenic bacteria, but also improve some mineral reabsorption. So you need to be sure you have more carbohydrate fermentation and less protein putrefaction. And it's then easy to understand that uh, enzymes will play a key role in the digestibility of protein that needs to be maximized in the upper part of the gut, but also the NSPAs that will need to be controlled to be sure we are producing the right uh, carbohydrates and ensure this cascade of reaction. Another thing we need to consider when we are thinking about fiber is which kind of criteria then we are to look at and, and to target. And for us, from the, the data we have and the correlation, the correlation and what would be the criteria, the most relevant and the more, uh, the one that is going to explain most of the effect we, we have seen is the soluble arabinose plus xylose. And depending on uh, the concentration of this uh, criteria, we have seen different effects. So just an example here that I, I do very um, important and interesting to share is the, the different behavior of young chick to more mature um, broiler faced to the, this concentration of soluble arabinose plus xylose. So let's go step by step. In this first graph on the left, you have the behavior of young chicks so from zero to 10 days in terms of uh, M uh, mortality corrected FCR, so the, the performance, to the increased uh, concentration of soluble arabinose plus uh, xylose here. So you can see they are not able to cope with this uh, substrate because you have the the high FCR here with the higher uh, concentration of the soluble A plus X. So the best FCR you can reach is when you have the low uh, soluble arabinose plus xyos because they are not able to extract the energy and to cope with this source of fiber. 
And that's completely the contrary when you look at more mature birds, where finally where they will reach the best FCR is at this uh, high uh, concentration of soluble A plus X. It, it seems even that th there is like a requirement of soluble A plus X, Arabinos plus Xylos, to reach the best FCR in more mature birds. So what is different between them is the maturity. And here it, you may have a more mature uh, microbiome that are already able to cope with the with this soluble A plus X and know how to ferment it and extract the energy from there, where the, the young birds are not yet able. So there is some new uh, category of product like the steam biotic that will uh, have uh, as the target to improve this capacity in, in early stage of the birds to give them this, this uh, ability to extract the energy of the soluble arabinose plus xylose. So the same graph when supplemented with a steam biotic, you can see that you have a different uh, response because you give them the, the, the capacity to use this substrate and translate it in energy. And in this case, it translated better uh, FCR. So depending, so there is different things to take into account because there is the criteria, but also the product you are using. So, and, and it will change the way you are going to think the fiber fraction in, in your feed and the effect it, it may have in terms of performance. So another study I would like to share in, in swine that is really interesting, looking at um, swine in different uh, environments. So the good sanitary condition in the green or dirty uh, sanitary condition in the in the pink here. What we look at is the TNF alpha as a marker of the inflammation response in the blood. And uh, in comparing a control or um, swine supplemented with a steam biotic. So you can see that in, in good sanitary condition, I will focus on day 35 because that's the same response at day 14. But you can see that they um, supplemented with the steam biotic in, in good sanitary condition, just give a numerical uh, decrease of TNF alpha. So not, not a big impact because we don't have an infl inflammatory response here in good sanitary condition. Where we have a very nice effect is in the dirty uh, condition where the control show a very high level of TNF alpha. That is counteract when pigs were supplemented with the steam biotic. And you can see that there is a clear decrease of the TNF alpha comparing the control to the swine, the, the pigs supplemented with the steam biotic. We also tested some other products looking at, at gut health that are more intermediate um, results. So that's very interesting. And what could be the, the, the application? Here yeah, it's another study where they look at the effect of a control based diet. Uh, a, a diet supplemented with sugar beet pulp to limit the, the tiaria in piglets and the control supplemented uh, with the steam biotic. So in terms of performance, they were quite similar between the sugar beet pulp and the, and the steam biotic inclusion. But you can see that there is a clear reduction here of the percentage of the antibiotic treatments. So supporting the effect of better gut health and that um, limit the need of antibiotic treatments. So going to the conclusions of, the, of my talk uh, today, gut health is dependent of many factors, um, but nutritional tools, enzymes and fiber are available. And we need to be sure we are using it properly and to give uh, optimal gut integrity and, and, and a better capacity of our animals uh, to cope with any enteric uh, challenge. So the first one we discussed was the enzymes uh, that are very relevant tools by increasing the digestibility of the, of the, of the nutrient, the, the global digestibility, I would say. But there is probably uh, much more uh, to extract from the application of enzymes that, than we do. And I took the example of the inositol release and the alkaline uh, phosphatase um, that that may need to be explored a bit more in deep. Controlling um, what is arriving uh, or what is product uh, produced, sorry, what is produced from the NSPAs 
uh, that is going to be also very important uh, because it going, it's going to drive the, the fermentation, beneficial or, or not. And having a better monitoring of fiber characteristic, I think we are on a good way in monogastric to understand a bit more um, what kind of fiber will be uh, beneficial um, or will be required um, to optimize uh, the, the gut health and also the performance of the, of the animals and to help them to have a quick and adequate uh, microbiome establishment. And all of the three above are relevant tools, interlinked, but the strategy needs to be adjusted following the target. Uh, we cannot add uh, one plus one plus one because it's not going to be additive. So the strategy needs really to be to be um, accurate and, and choose depending on the, the target. And if I have one take home message, message oh, my French is going back. Um, is think also enzymes application beyond the nutritional matrix. It's clear that uh, there is a lot to extract from, from enzyme application and depending on how you are using and what is the target. And look at fiber as the feed uh, for gut microbiome because fiber is not always bad and need to be considered to help us and, and, and extract the value from, from, from there. And I would like to thank you all for, for listening. And you have my uh, email there. So if you have any, any question or if you want to reach me, please feel free. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Rousseau. Before we get started answering questions, we'd like to share a brief video and then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Organic trace minerals come in many types and formulations, leading to confusion about chemistry, terminology, and methodologies. With Balchem's Keysure line of chelated minerals, we provide superior performance and exceptional value by keeping it simple. Binding minerals to the highest quality plant protein-derived amino acids and peptides in our world-class production facilities using a true chelation process pioneered by Balchem and trusted in both the human and animal arenas for nearly 60 years. The Keysure line delivers proven and consistent bioavailability to maximize performance and a no-frills pricing approach for greater profitability. Visit balchemanh.com to see how Keysure chelated minerals are your link to superior performance and exceptional value. As a reminder, you can still submit questions to the questions pane in the attendee control panel. Dr. Russo, our first question is, what would be the dose of phytase to maximize uh, inositol production and reduce inflammatory response? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I don't have any any dose to, to, to recommend, but uh, as you as I show you in the in the cascade and of the hydrolysis of the phytate to the IP6, IP5, IP4, IP3 to the IP2, if we want to maximize the inositol production, we would need very high dose of phytase. What we use so far is uh, around 2,000 FTU of um, of phytase per kilo of phytase, and that clearly lead to the 90% hydrolysis of the of the phytate and the release of inositol. And we consider this uh, inositol release is responsible for 30% of the improving performance we 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 see in in, in the field. So probably we would need to even go higher to really maximize this uh, inositol and to be sure we are breaking down uh, IP6, IP5 uh, till IP4, IP3. Because, and, and you know, you also need to consider the phytase itself because not all of them uh, will be able to hydrolyze all of these esters. Some will stop at the IP5, some will start at the IP4. And we have seen we are phytase that we can go and hydrolyze the IP4 and IP3, helping really the, the, the alkaline phosphatase to take out the last phos phosphate and produce the inositol. So we would need to go uh, higher than, I would say, higher than 2000, much higher. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Abraham would like to know, what is the relation between IAP activity and calcium level? Ah, that's a, yeah, that's a, a really good question because it's something I didn't discuss in the, in the presentation going um, beyond the, the minerals. And th there is a clear relationship because if you think calcium, calcium is going to be bind to, to phytate. And clearly, when you, you have the, 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 the phytate increase, you will reduce the alkaline uh, phosphatase. So we, you reduce the calcium availability. So all of them will be interlinked so, and will play a role on the alkaline, uh, alkaline phosphatase um, because of, of this. All yeah. right, thank you. Uh, June May would like to know, uh, for fiber components, what's the most practical way to identify and analyze which components really impact gut microbiota, especially butyric acid bacteria? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. That's something we are exploring a, a lot uh, uh, this time. Um, what we can do, what we can analyze is the, the non-stark polysaccharides. Uh, we have to admit that um, it, before we used crude fiber because it was um, a criteria we know or the NDF. Uh, we know and we used to work with and it was not a lot of um, work, uh, manual work, I would say, to, to, to analyze, where the non-stack polysaccharides is very time consuming and very expensive um, analysis to, to run. And especially if you, if you want to divide in the soluble and the insoluble fraction and looking at the individual components. Now it's something uh, that is, is, is not true today because uh, we, are, uh, we were able to develop some uh, NIR calibration. So now you can analyze the NSP uh, profile of your raw materials just by scanning the raw materials. And, and through the NIR and the robust calibration we have developed, you can have a NSP profile of the, of the raw materials. Then in terms of the criteria we should uh, look at, um, I would say for me, the, the, the most re relevant one, or at least from my experience and, and the data we, we have, and it, it's probably the soluble arabinose uh, plus xylose, that is the, the one that is most, the best, um, the best one correlated with the fermentation process, so the, the gut health and the production of butyrate. So probably I would target the soluble arabinose plus xylose, but we also need to be careful to look at the proportion of the insoluble to soluble. So the concentration itself will not be enough. And probably we, we could look at the ratio between insoluble and soluble uh, arabinose plus xylose that could be a very good indicator. All right, thank you, Dr. Russo. Um, Carrie would like to know, is there a synergistic effect in using phytase and xylanase? Do we need more enzymes? Yeah, uh, clearly there is a synergetic effect between the, the enzymes and um, working on the digestibility of the, of, of, of the feed itself. So you have the phytase uh, that will going to have an effect on the, on the phytate and the, the xylanase on the arabinoxylan. And we know also the NSPAs will also act on the viscosity effect and the viscosity um, limit the, 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 how can I say that, the access of the enzymes, so the exogenous, but also the digestivity digestive enzymes. So all will play a role and they have synergetic effect. Then the additivity, um, unfortunately, it's, it's not true. Uh, one plus one uh, doesn't equal to two uh, when speaking about enzymes and, and why. And it's because the, 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 the response of the enzymes will depend of the, the substrate or the percentage of substrate they have. So if you start with a 100% uh, undigestible pool, uh, you have a, a first enzyme that is going to act and increase the digestibility of this pool. So you move from 100 to 50%, let's say, I'm, I'm going to be um, 50%. So you, you still have 50% to digest, but that's, that means also that you have half part 
uh, to be digested uh, by the second enzyme. So you have less substrate, so you have less response uh, to the enzymes. And this is going to decrease and decrease. So from the first enzymes you are using to the second, to the third and to the fourth. So, and that's why we really need to think about the, the strategy because more doesn't more enzymes doesn't mean a better effect. So sometimes you need to be careful and choose the proper one and where you have a good control in terms of what is going to produce by the enzymes you, you are using that you are sure it's going to have a beneficial effect. And second, uh, in terms of the economical uh, interest, you need to be sure that the, the enzymes you are using is going to have a good return of investment because it can be a very good enzymes where there is nothing uh, in the diet, but maybe the, 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 the effect you can see when you already have a phytase and NSPase and I know, a mananase, the fourth enzymes we ha will not have a lot of effect or at least not enough to be economically um, interesting, I would say. Hope it answers right. the, the question. Yeah, thank you for that. I see we've strayed beyond the top of the hour just a bit here. So I'm going to one final question, which is a bit futuristic. Uh, Alex is asking, um, when to expect smart enzymes that will self-regulate their activity in relation to the appropriate or optimal levels of substrate? It seems that modulation of activity is a one-way street and having self-regulating enzymes would be better for non-nutritional strategies for enzyme use. Your thoughts? Oh, in fact, it's, it's a very interesting question. Um, and, and in fact, uh, when I prepared uh, this talk, because I'm, I'm working with enzymes for eight years already, and we often see um, enzymes for their uh, nutritional matrix value. So what it, they are going to bring and how we can save costs or what the nutrients we are going to release can help to get better performance. I think, in fact, uh, we would need to think beyond this application and more than looking at performance um, as FCR when we are speaking about enzymes, maybe more looking at the productivity. And it's where uh, gut health is going to play a key role because gut health, ensuring a, a gut health doesn't always mean a better FCR. Sometimes it is, but sometimes not. But sometimes it's often a mean a better productivity. So what I'm, uh, I mean by productivity, uh, it's a better homogeneity, um, less, um, less mortality and having some side effect like the, the carcass yield or the, the limiting of the breast uh, myopathies. All of these side effects would need to be considered and, and think uh, when using uh, enzymes and how they are regulated and what they are re regulated. I show you, I think, the, the example of the of the phytase and the this cascade of reaction uh, between the alkaline alkaline phosphatase and the and the LPS antigenicity. I think there is a lot to extract from phytase more than what we are doing uh, so far. So, yeah, probably it's it's the the future of the development of enzymes. Maybe would be to look at this uh, side effect and how we we can uh, develop some some different kind of uh, application. Well, thank you, Dr. Rosso, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com and we'll forward them to you along with the unanswered questions from today's session. Our next webinar will be on June 15th. Dr. Anna Kate Shoveler from the University of Guelph will discuss how sulfur amino acids, taurine, and methyl compounds impact pet dietary formulations. Come and visit us at the Real Science Exchange, Balchem's podcast series, where we take a deeper dive into some of the webinar topics and many other concepts that are important to you. We now have 16 episodes on YouTube, your favorite podcast platform, and at balchemanh.com slash podcast. 
The last episode features the Pet Food Research Program from Kansas State University. Search for Real Science Exchange on your favorite podcast platform and be sure to subscribe. On behalf of Balcam and Dr. Russo, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.